Susan, what is the continuity you see between uh, the moment of Maastricht through the Lisbon Agenda and, and the Lisbon Treaty, the Six Pack, and now this new fiscal treaty? Mm. Well, um, thank you, Brid, for the question and the opportunity to answer. You know that I've been a French citizen right after Maastricht. I was not allowed to vote in Maastricht, but uh, it was a treaty that presented two completely arbitrary figures, 3% budget deficit with regard to the GNP and 60% 60, 60 for the debt. Why not 4% or 2%? Why not 65 or 55? Nobody knows what they came out of the sky, those numbers. But they have become sort of religious symbols. It's sort of the holy, uh, the holy numbers of Maastricht. And so what has happened since then? That was the first effort to get uh, government policy under control. But actually, countries didn't respect that, including Germany that didn't respect those figures. And when the time of Lisbon came, we'd rather stop talking about that. And Lisbon was about different uh, issues because that treaty, when people read, which they did in France, it was the biggest debate we'd had since May 68, when they read what was actually in the European treaties, they were horrified when they saw that we were going to be forever uh, under the command of NATO with the American president as commander-in-chief, when they saw all of the economic detail, when they saw a certain number of things in France which made them frightened for what we call laïcité, secularism, uh, there were innumerable issues in that treaty that people just said, I don't like this, that, or the other. But we, and we've had the biggest campaign uh, nobody expected, in the establishment, no one expected us to win. We started off with 70% for the yes, 30% for the no. That's probably why they let us have a referendum. And we voted 55% no. The establishment was furious. All of the major media, all of the politicians, they were stunned and they were furious. And they said, in private, never again. So what happened after that? After the French and the Dutch had voted against this treaty in no uncertain terms, the Dutch vote was 60% against, they got into a very secret group, they had a small committee writing a new treaty, making it even more complicated. They drafted the Lisbon Treaty with the help of the top judicial experts of the commission. Uh, it was completely opaque as a process. There were no elected representatives in the group that wrote it. And they simply took the constitution that we had defeated, threw out the Beethoven hymn, threw out the flag, and a couple of other little trimmings. But as Valéry Giscard d'Estaing said, and he was the chief architect of the constitution, they have made it, they have made cosmetic changes to make it easier to swallow. And every other official, including Mrs. Merkel, said this is exactly the same thing as the constitutional treaty. Don't worry, uh, nothing has changed. It's, it's the same. And many, many other officials said that, including Barroso, the president of the commission. So here we have Lisbon. We're not allowed to vote on it because obviously we're going to vote the wrong way. Uh, it is made clear that no one will have a referendum except for Ireland, gallant little Ireland has it in its constitution that it must have a referendum every time there is a change in the European constitution because, and we should all have that provision, the European constitution and the European legislation provides 80-85% of our national legislation. It just gets transferred into national law. So when you're uh, under the control of uh, a non-democratic Europe, this is very serious because that's going to be transposed into your own national law. Well, <clears throat> fortunately, I had, the, uh, I had the good luck to be asked by the Irish to help them on fighting against the Lisbon Treaty. Again, we won. It was fantastic, starting from a very low level and then for one reason or another people understanding what it was about, they said no, even though it was extraordinarily complicated to read. 
And so they didn't vote correctly either. They had to be disciplined. They had to be told to vote again. But by that time, the, the uh, crisis had broken. And the Irish were more or less told, if you don't vote right this time, uh, say yes, then you are going to be in very deep trouble. And you are not going to get any loans. And you are not going to get any help coming out of the crisis. So they dutifully went back to the polls and voted yes. Why do we have to have, in addition to all of this, what's called the six-pack, the fiscal compact, and now a new treaty, which I think we should just call the austerity treaty. It has a much longer name, but forget that. It's the austerity treaty. Why do we need this? We need it because Germany, principally, a few other countries want this engraved in stone. They want those Maastricht numbers that people were not paying attention to. They want them engraved in marble. So 3%, and I'm back to the beginning of my long answer, 3% budget deficit allowable maximum, 60% debt allowed maximum. This means that states, member states, are going to lose one of their principal powers in national sovereignty, power over their own finances. They are not going to be able to control that because it is all going to be controlled uh, by Brussels. And I think that we have a serious problem with this because Brussels wants austerity. What does that mean? Or is, austerity simply means that there is going to be an attack on every measure that has been passed before and since World War II to give ordinary people, workers, ill people, children, old people, to remove the benefits that they fought for and won over the last 50 to 100 years. It is that serious. Because the way the commission interprets what has happened, that is to say that we do have higher debts and we do have budget deficits, but the European Commission and the governments are pretending that these deficits exist because we have been, quote unquote, living beyond our means. That is not the case. It's not because old people have been getting their checks for retirement or unemployed people have been receiving compensation. It has nothing to do with social spending. We have deficits because when the crisis came, our governments had to spend huge amounts to bail out the banks. They had to confront a drop in GNP of about 5%, which is a lot of money. Maybe it doesn't sound like much, but in an economy, it's huge. So they had to try to compensate for that. That also costs a lot of money. And since there was more unemployment, they were not receiving the tax income that they were used to receiving. So that was a, a drop in the income with an increase in the expenditures. So, and since they won't tax the rich, uh, there was no money in the till. So what did they do? They say, ah, it's up to the people to pay. So what has happened is that the banks have contributed zero. They're not being asked to make any sacrifices at all. So we are punishing the innocent that is to say the people who are supposed to pay through austerity, and we are rewarding the guilty because the banks are continuing to receive huge privileges and subsidies from our governments. So that is why we must defeat this fiscal compact, this austerity treaty, and all of the measures that come along with it, uh, unless we want Europe to be uh, retrograded to, shall we say, the 19th century. That's what it's about.